Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Norma Vasquez. I am the president of the Friends. The president of the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Public Library. And we are a group of volunteers that help and support the programs of the Poughkeepsie Library. Uh, we run a bookstore at the Borman Road Library uh, building. And we sell uh, Gentile books, CDs, DVDs, and records. We open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, we are very uh, welcome if you are going over there. It's a good deal. <laughs> Uh, now, it's my pleasure to present uh, Catherine Burke, educator, author, and director of Historic Bridges of the Hudson Valley, uh, shares her appreciation and knowledge of these bridges through photograph archives of the New York State Bridge Authority, the Mojeski Master Engineer Firm, and the Smithsonian Museum of American History. Uh, you can see over there, this is the second book that uh, she finished about the Hobson, uh, the Mick Hobson Valley uh, Bridges. Please help me to welcome Catherine Burke. Catherine. <laughs> This is probably easier to stand than it's probably to fall off. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for your interest in the bridges. Wow, these lights are bright. Um, the bridges really uh, begin with the story of the Bridge Authority, which was created in 1932. Um, and the first bridge that they were, actually the reason they were created was to fund the building of the Rip M. Winkle Bridge. Can you guys all hear me out there? Am I using this mic okay? All right, good. Um, but the state decided that they also should take over the Mid-Hudson Bridge. Um, the Mid-Hudson Bridge is the first bridge we'll talk about since that became the first bridge of the New York State Bridge Authority. They took it over in 1933 um, for operating and maintaining that bridge. Um, so let's get started. Cliff told me 40 minutes tops, <laughs> so I'll have to make sure I move fast here. Um, anybody recognize where this is? This is Poughkeepsie, actually a little bit south of Marist College. Um, this is actually where they're going to build the bridge. So this is what it looked like. You could see Highland across the way. And they actually laid the cornerstone. Uh, I believe that's Governor Al Smith there. Laid the cornerstone in 1925 for the Mid-Hudson Bridge. And you can see this is the East Anchorage, all right? And watching all the construction there is that railroad bridge. Uh, we have a story about the railroad bridge when we get to the Bear Mountain Bridge, so don't let me forget about that. Okay, so everything started to go well. They were digging the caissons. Um, Majeski, Ralph Majeski um, designed the bridge. Um, and he partnered for the Mid-Hudson Bridge with Daniel Moran. And the reason he partnered with Daniel Moran was Daniel Moran was instrumental in doing the piers for the railroad bridge. So they figured, well, Daniel must know the bottom of the Hudson really well. Um, side note, I do a lot of STEM education at, with educators in the Hudson Valley and talk to a lot of students. And, you know, the students think it's a flat bottom. It's not. Okay, so Daniel ran into some issues. So here's the east abutment. Um, construct, or constructing a um, suspension bridge follow pretty much the same plans for everything. Um, what happens is you put in the base of the piers. In this case, the base of the piers are in the water. Um, so they, they're using open caissons, not the closed kind that they used for the um, Brooklyn Bridge. 
if you can think of the difference. And what they do is they, they sink the case on, and as they're sinking it, they're building it, okay? Um, what happened was, and this happened um, early in the morning on July 27th, 1927. There's the case on. As you can see, there's the bottom, not so much the very bottom, but the, the I'll show you a diagram in a second, it helps. Um, it tipped. And if you can imagine, and it listed probably about that much. So if you were the people working at that hour of the morning, imagine what their reaction was. Okay, so that what they had to do in the Hudson 24 seven was try to write this thing. And the way they did it was take what they called car floats. And I still have no idea why they call them a car float. But what they did was tie anchors, and you'll see this better in the book, a lot more pictures, tie anchor ropes to this pier over here. I'm sorry, I'm pointing in my laptop as if you could see it, to the completed pier there before it was completed to pull on the one side and lift up the other side for a year, over a year, okay? And when they finally righted it, and you could see the date on the bottom of this photo, it took over a year to get it to the point where they can think, oh, wow, I guess we can build this bridge after all. So raise your hand if you thought, wow, maybe the Mid-Hudson Bridge might not have been built because that was a distinct possibility back then. Think about it. They laid the cornerstone in 1925, and here they are in 1928 in August, and they've got this kind of situation. So what they did, oh, here's your diagram for you. Okay, so that's kind of what the caisson looks like. And what they do, and you'll see a little bit better in the next picture, is that contractor comes along, and he's the guy that's the the pier guy, and he'll fill cells in this caisson, okay? And he has to fill them in a specific order in a specific way, or it can tip. And apparently he took the hit for tipping this caisson. They did a whole study after the fact, and he was held responsible. But what they did, and think about it, this is in 19... 28, okay, 27 into 28. What did they have to do this with? If anybody's been swimming in the Hudson River, you don't have to go down too deep to not be able to see anything, okay? So they had divers. They could go down and dig it out, but they were really limited in what they could do down there. So this picture shows you a little bit better what those cells kind of look like. You can see it's all divided, almost like a honeycomb, and they have to fill it in a balanced way so that it sinks evenly. And here's the East Pier. Now what happens with the caisson is at ground level, then they start to put stone by ground level, I mean bottom of the river level. They put the, they put the stone, and build it all the way up. So this is granite block around here. So that's what you see at the bottom of the tower. And here we are, can you see the date on this one? April 29th, 1929. The bridge opens on August 25th, 1930. So they got a lot of work to do. And here they are celebrating. Of course, the big guy comes along, that's Ralph Majeski there laying the last block on the top of the tower so they can, or excuse me, on the top of the pier so they can begin to erect the tower. So I know we have a Q&A at the end, but if somebody has a quick question on anything I'm saying, if you wanna just raise your hand, um, I can do that as well. So as you can see, the West Tower is almost completed. And here we are starting to build the East Tower. 
All right, so once the towers are up, and this is the way they do it with all suspension bridges, um, you'll see it when we look quickly at the Bear Mountain as well. Um, they put, first thing they put is what they call foot bridges. And those are strong where the cable is gonna be strong because the workers need to walk up and down those as they string the cables. And that's done before there's any decking because the bridge is hung from that cable. So there's the footbridge. A lot of um, a lot of records of people actually walking those footbridge to get from Highland to Poughkeepsie. I don't think I would do that, but <laughs> it's much wider than it looks. Uh, but here's the workers, and as you can see, they string the cables, and most cables are strung this way. You could see that they're clustered. Okay, so they string the cables and then they tighten groups of them together and then they'll tighten the whole cable together. And you can see that it's wrapped here. The main cable is finished on this and it's going down to the anchorage. Okay, so here we are on August 14th, 1930 and they're concreting. When did I say this is opening? How many days? 11 days from now, and there they are. That's Poughkeepsie, and that's the crowd that's listening to speeches and waiting for the bridge to open. Lots of speeches. Um, governor Smith, then, you know, previous Governor Smith was there, and so was FDR. Um, FDR and Eleanor opened the bridge. This is, if you look on the left, that's um, Colonel Frederick Stewart Green. He was the head of DPW back then, was called the Department of Public Works. And he was the person who was in charge of building the Mid-Hudson Bridge. And he'll also be in charge of building the Rip M. Winkle. That's Eleanor. There's Ralph Majeski. And Daniel Moran is standing to his right and I kind of always maintained I've never seen him in a picture with a smile, and it's probably because of that issue with the case on. And there's the bridge. And this was on August 29th, 1930. And you can see the old toll booth. You can see all the people there. Okay, now, this is the Rip Van Winkle. One of the things that I like to study on when, as I'm looking at all these bridges, and I'll point out a few things to you today, is the difference in construction from the 1920s to the 1930s to the 1940s. And, the, and you'll see a huge difference between a tip caisson and how it was dealt with when they had one on the south span of the Newburgh Beacon in 1978. Okay. But this is the piers being constructed or being filled, I guess, similar to that. Um, again, these were open caissons for the Rip Van Winkle Bridge. Um, I've seen evidence that there was one closed caisson, but I haven't been able to find any more information about that. All right, now, the Rip Van Winkle is a cantilevered bridge for the most part. Um, as you can see, I don't know how to point these out here. Those four thin tower looking things, those are called false work. They're there temporarily to hold up that part of the bridge because what they're going to do is connect. This is going to be where they put the cantilevered section, they drop it in. Now they're not gonna drop it in on the rip, they're gonna build out from there and you'll see a picture in a minute, but they hold the bridge secure until it's all built and that's what those false works are. And there they are completing that cantilevered section. And if you look at the arch, see that that straight section is that cantilevered section. I'm sorry, that cantilevered section is in the center and that hangs between the two side sections. Then here we are, they're working on the roadway. 
Um, the Bridge Authority was very, very conscious of hiring local work. Most of these contractors came up out of the city and they wanted to bring their workers with them. And the Bridge Authority insisted on 50% of local labor. Um, you know, this was an important time and jobs were, were scarce. Uh, the RIP was started in 1934, opened in 19, actually 33, started in 33 and opened in 35. This concrete mixer looks a little bit different than the one that was used on the Mid-Hudson. Um, and there's the administration building being constructed. You can see parts of the bridge past that. This is on the west side. Did anybody ever notice the weather vane on top of the Rip Van Winkle administration building? It's RIP, okay, and it's still there. It's pretty cool. And there they are on opening day. The opening of the RIP Van Winkle coincided with the 150th anniversary of the city of Hudson. So they had some um, pretty serious um, celebrations for both. And that's a pretty cool photo. Um, with the um, cashless tolling now, all of the toll booths have been removed and none of that really cool stuff is still there anymore. Anybody recognize this bridge? Now it says Kingston Rhinecliffe, but that's not the Kingston Rhinecliffe. This was the original proposed design for the Kingston Rhinecliffe Bridge. It was actually originally supposed to be a suspension bridge, and that's right there at the mouth of the Roundout Creek, just north of there. And the concern was that they'd end up with a situation like they have in Poughkeepsie. You guys know how long they've been talking about, <laughs> what do we do with the, you know, the, the turnarounds and how you get onto nine and all those kind of things. And they were afraid to dump bridge traffic right into both sides of that bridge. And at that time, this was back in the 50s, at that time, the interstate roads were coming in and they wanted to connect the throughway with the Taconic. Okay, so what they did is move it three miles north and they could no longer construct a, a um, suspension bridge. Now, this bridge was designed by D.B. Steinman. Does anybody know D.B. Steinman? He's a really important bridge engineer. Um, he was responsible for creating bridge engineering or engineering as a certified profession, okay? He also designed the Mackinac Straits Bridge, if anybody's been across that, that's a pretty impressive bridge. But what they did, there's another picture of it, it looks kind of similar to the Mid-Hudson, doesn't it? What they ended up doing was when they moved three miles north, they couldn't do the suspension bridge, so they did the design of the under deck truss bridge, which actually, it's pretty impressive in its own right. When it opened, it was the longest under deck truss bridge in the world. So it's pretty impressive. So here we are. Now they're um, doing the caissons here. And remember I told you about different changes to how things are constructed? The Kingston Rhinecliffe used Tremie concrete. Now Tremie concrete isn't necessarily a different type of concrete, but it's a different process for using concrete. And you can actually pour it directly into water, but it doesn't, you have to make sure that you pour the concrete into the concrete in the water, if that makes sense. Um, so it's kind of like having a straw at the bottom with some sludge there. And as long as you pour into the concrete and the concrete comes up, the concrete actually cures better in the water than it does if it's out of the water. It has that nice cooler temperature. And more often than not, you see when they've poured new concrete, they're trying to keep it wet because it'll keep it from cracking. Um, so this is a new way that they did that. These, um, diagrams that I'm showing you are actually on interpretive signs that are at the Kingston Rhinecliffe Bridge. Have any of you seen the interpretive signs? They're on all of the bridges now. We have them on 
I'm pretty sure they put the, the, the Newburgh Beacon ones up. They were waiting till the construction finished. Um, but we have signs that explain the history and all kinds of things about the people who built the bridge and things about the area. So this is an interesting thing about the Kingston Rhinecliff. This is called a box pier, okay, the, the big one right there. And what happens on the Kingston Rhinecliff is over the water section, they have the under deck truss. The part from the box pier back to the roadway is a girder section. So it's much narrower, it's not as deep. So they can't connect it with your usual tower because it wouldn't be a secure connection. So what they did was have a box pier on the east side and a box pier on the west side to make that connection. And in addition, inside the box pier, they can keep all their electrical stuff and things like that. And actually, an interesting thing, as they were building the bridge, inside the box pier, they used that as the office where you could go and get your paycheck. So that was kind of cool. So you can see, again, the Kingston Ryan Cliff is similar to the Rip Van Winkle and that it's cantilevered. So they would start at the towers and go out and then add sections in between. Generally, the um, channel part of the, of the river where the, you know, the bridge is, there's two channels on the Kingston Ryan Cliff, two main channels. One, the one on the west is used more often than the one on the right but they need a wider stretch open for ships to go by. So that's why they can't deliver the sections. Personally, I always love the photos where you can see people working. It just, I look at those guys and I think, mm, no way would I go up there. These photos were um, loaned to me for the, the, these are not in the book, but these were loaned to me for use with historic bridges um, from the Hudson River Maritime. They had been donated to Hudson River Maritime. Prior to that, we really didn't have that many construction photos of the Kingston Rhinecliff. In order to have the ones um, Norma had mentioned that um, for the Mid-Hudson Bridge, we got those from Majeski and Masters archives. And then the Rip Van Winkle ones, I went down to the Smithsonian. I found out that they were, they had 65 photos down there. And they let you take digital pictures. If you don't come down to take the digital pictures, they'll do it for you for $35 a piece, which I thought, ah, I'll take a trip to Washington. So this is an interesting thing about the Kingston Rhinecliff. The Mohawk iron workers. You know, you see the people climbing around up there. Um, they were used to working at heights. Um, they did a lot of the um, pole work in Western New York, and they also did a lot of work in New York City, and they, also, they worked on the Kingston Ryan Cliff. You could see, yeah. But you could see how they would go up, build on top of the tower, and then connect the sections of truss. Great photos, right? And there they are. They're going to connect. Very similar. They call those creepers. It's kind of a crane sort of a thing where they would lift up from the river to um, con you know, bring up the steel from the river to make the connection and finish the bridge. And once the truss was done, then they could do the deck. And this is Averill Harriman. They decided to open the Kingston Rhinecliff. Um, for a soft opening, I guess, if you will, in February of 57, because they couldn't run the ferry, and there was a lot of people that needed to get to work at IBM. So <laughs> they opened the bridge. Um, and then they came back and did it again in May. So it was officially opened in May. And this is what the, the Bridge Authority does to maintain that bridge. More often than not, work on the Kingston Rhinecliff is underneath. And they do regular inspections and painting. Um, those bridges are in great shape. I know people say, wait, well, hey, there was potholes. Potholes aren't the ones you need to worry about. <laughs> What's underneath that pothole is what you need to worry about. 
Okay, so we're just gonna quickly do, I don't know how we're doing on time here. We're doing okay? Yeah. Um, we have, this is a quick look at the, <laughs> quick look at the Newburgh Beacon. This is the first span of the Newburgh Beacon. Um, when I was in college, my parents had moved to Pleasantville in Westchester County, and I didn't want to drive on the top of too much traffic. So I remember driving on this bridge when it was two lanes. And when I say two lanes, I mean one lane going west and one lane going east um, with a little bitty guardrail. I see some people nodding. You remember that bridge. Okay, so whenever anybody complains to me about driving on the Newburgh Beacon Bridge now, you got to be kidding, right? Um, but yeah, so this was completed and opened in 1963. You know, Rockefeller took a lot of heat for not making it a four lane at the time, but he didn't want to take any federal money um, and assumed they were going to make another one anyway, which they did. So here we go with differences in construction. When they went to build the south span of the Newburgh Beacon Bridge, yep. Yeah, I guess at the time there were too many strings attached. Can't imagine that, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it, what's that? Actually, you know what? It's funny. The tolls, the to raise your hand if you ever buy a cup of coffee. Okay, so the amount for your cup of coffee is, all, is probably more than your toll for that bridge. And your toll for that bridge ensures, for this particular bridge, ensures that that's, that's a safe bridge. Okay, um, so to my mind, anybody that says, I want to drive a tollless bridge, okay, about the time they were redoing the North Span, I think that's the timing, you guys remember the Mianus River Bridge? Yeah. Over the river in Connecticut, right into the river. So I will guarantee you that's not going to happen to any of our bridges, okay, because of the maintenance on the bridges. You know, so it's, I think it's money well spent. Uh, but yes, you're correct. If they took it from the federal government, which is funny, they ended up doing for the second span. The south span was primarily um, federal funds, but by then they had worked out a deal for them that they could still put tolls on the bridge on that federal property, basically, the federal road, I guess, on the Interstate 84. So it's unusual. The bridge authority is also required to keep all their tolls the same on their bridges. So that's an interesting component also. Uh, a few years back, there was a move to put the bridge authority with the thruway authority. And the concern at that point was that, you know, first of all, you might not get the same kind of care because this is a small community. I mean, most of us know someone who works for the bridge authority. It's a small authority who cares about the Hudson Valley, but also they're required to keep the tolls the same Another authority might not be able, not have to do that. And you could easily see the Newburgh Beacon, which is really the one that takes care of all the other bridges with the tolls going much higher. And that would be, you know, a concern for the rest of the Hudson Valley. But anyway, back to the story here. This is an assembly yard. So what they did was they built this assembly yard. It's in New Windsor, just south of the city of Newburgh on the west side. And what they did was built sections of truss, moved them up the river, lifted them in. Now remember I told you that there was a chip case on on the Newburgh Beacon? Okay, looks like a similar kind of thing, doesn't it? But now they've got these cranes that are floating. They're able to go down there. They're able to put in this hydraulic jack and help to move it. And it was a matter of a, a few weeks and they were able to write that case on. So it's a huge difference. And here we are. I love this picture. Yes. Well, 
Well, the New Deal was later, right? Because he was still governor in 32, right? So if we're talking the actual New Deal, that was when he became president and came in after that. So I don't think, because we have, remember, the Rip Van Winkle opened in 35, and then the next bridge was the Kingston Rhinecliffe, and that wasn't open until 57. So there was a bit of a gap there. Okay, so the 57 bridge was more affected by the interstate federal stuff than the, the New Deal. Uh, but this is a cool, this is lifting in the last um, section of the southbound span. Then they came over to the um, northbound span, redid all the abutments because they were going to um, widen the bridge to three lanes. Didn't just do the abutment, did the steel, check to make sure all the steel was good and put in additional steel. And I love this picture. Way before OSHA, I guess, too, huh? Um, but this guy is painting the north span to match the south span. Some people say brown, some people say red. Okay, we just had a special, do I have a few more minutes? Okay, we had a special ceremony down at the Bear Mountain Bridge. Bear Mountain Bridge is going to be 100 in 19 or in 2024. Okay, so we buried a time capsule, and the reason we buried the time capsule now we didn't actually bury it. It's going into one of the anchorages. Is that the contract to to construct the Bear Mountain Bridge was signed in March, March 24th specifically, in 1923. The bridge opened in November of 24. That's pretty fast. So here we are. Does this look familiar? One of the reasons they were able to do the Bear Mountain so fast is the piers are not in the water. A little bit of the toe of this guy, of the one on the west side, is in the water. So they had some case on underneath that. But there they are doing the footbridges. And you can see the footbridges in place. I like this photo, which I got from Palisades Interstate Park Commission. They have a really nice archive of things that are related to the Bear Mountain Bridge. That's that goat trail that we drive on. They literally carved it out of Anthony's nose. And they had to be careful to not hit anything onto the railroad tracks. So there's the, you could see the road being built there. And there's the towers of the Bear Mountain with the footbridge that they're going to use to string the cables. And again, I love those pictures with people that are working. We actually, if you look on the Bridge Authority website, actually it's a B, BMB 100.com, I think it is. It's a centennial website and there's a, um, a video that we have on loan from the University of South Carolina that has a construction newsreel. That's really pretty cool. It's about eight minutes of people going through the bridge, you know, building the bridge, constructing the bridge. So there they are, ready to do the deck. And this is what the anchorage looks like. Um, those are the ends of the cable wires that are attached to what are called eye bars, which are, it looks like a big, uh, you know, kind of a wrench with a little bit of a thing on the end. Um, and they hook into another one and another one, and another one. Um, the anchorage, the base of the anchorage is actually probably about 40 feet back from what you see here and down 90 feet. And then what they do is cement everything in there so it's in there nice and tight. Some more photos. That's that 9W bridge over there. That opened back in the 20s. And the Popolo Open Creek. And there, you see them connecting the truss section. This is not too far from when they opened. And that's the administration building they're working on. Notice the toll booth is already there. And that's the West Point Band led the um, first crossing of the bridge. The bridge was actually ceremonially opened on November 26th 
Um, we'll see a couple pictures in a minute, but the public was allowed in on the 27th, which was Thanksgiving Day. And here's the important people waiting for the ribbon cutting. Um, apparently, Governor Odell, I never heard of him, but he um, was there for the opening. He and he also apparently, and I'm trying to find a picture of this, drove in the last rivet. Kind of interesting. And that's Mary Harriman, and she's pulling apart the plaque. Can you notice there's no building? They just put the walls up with the plaque so that they could open the bridge. And there it is, finished. Okay. Um, the administration building was actually completed the following April. And this is the toll house that's at the other end of the GOAT trail. They had a toll here to go all the way across and a toll on the other side. And it was pretty expensive. One of the first things the bridge authority did when they took over the bridge in 1940 was reduce the toll to 50 cents. They reduced it, it was 50 cents. The bridges were 50 cents each way at that point. Um, during the war, actually, probably right at the end of the war, they reduced the toll to 25 cents. And then in the 70s, they switched it to one way only. Well done. <laughs> Any questions? There's a lot more pictures and a lot more information in the book. Um, and we, I also have a website, hbhv.org, if you want to go on and take a look. We're on Facebook, like everybody is these days, I guess, Historic Bridges of the Hudson Valley. Um, and you can actually see some things about the, um, the centennial will be coming up. We have the time capsule. Does anybody have any questions? Wow, I did that well, huh? There's no questions. <laughs> uh, here's one. Go ahead. Do you know if any, how many people died in the building of the bridges with it, people falling off or any drowning? Any you statistics? know what, Nat, I don't know. The, de the Bear Mountain definitely had no loss of life, okay? None at all, if you can believe that. Um, I don't know for sure that's, that wasn't anything that's come up, so I would say no, um, but, you know, yeah. Hi, good morning. Um, why was the Bear Mountain Bridge like the first bridge to cross the Hudson up here? Oh, that's a whole nother story. Oh. <laughs> so it's that a was you, Cliff said, try do the bridges close by where we are. <laughs> and with the bridge with the Bear Mountain having a, um, its centennial, there's all kinds of incredible stuff to tell. But that was basically there um, because the Harrimans, you guys watched 1923, the Yellowstone. Okay, so there's a thing in there where they say the new thing that um, Montana is going to be known for is tourism. And that was in 1923, that people were starting to try to get out of the city and go to places where they could be out in the wild, okay? Harriman's and the Palisades Park were basically um, pushing that for people to come up to Bear Mountain Park, um, Harriman Park, and Palisades. Okay, and the Bear, the Harriman's had donated the parkland in 1919, and. I have great pictures I could have brought that have that show all the development of the Bear Mountain Inn and the park and the thousands and thousands of people that would go to visit. And what else happened in 1923 besides people deciding, oh, wow, well, let's go out somewhere is the car became more popular. OK, so between people wanting to get to the Bear Mountain Park, not wanting to wait on a boat because that was the only way you're getting there if you were coming from the city. A boat. There was no George Washington Bridge. There was no tunnel. The tunnel came before the, you know, came not that much longer from the Bear Mountain Bridge, but it was the only way to get there. And so they were sleeping in their cars at night, apparently, trying to get to the, you know, the ferry lines. Um, so Harriman's decided, actually, my take on it is that if you guys are familiar with the Word Street Bridge, 
in Kingston. That was a Terry and Tench bridge. Terry and Tench is the company, steel construction company that built the Bear Mountain Bridge. Terry and Tench built the Wirt Street with Roebling and opened it in 1921. So then as they're coming south, they put it out to Mrs. Harriman. It said, we'd like to build the Bear Mountain Bridge. They already had the design. They had the engineer that did that. Howard Baird had designed the bridge for, for Terry and Tench. And so they put it to the Harrimans. And Mary Harriman is supposedly had said, we don't have the money to build the bridge. And Roland, who was not much, he was probably in his 20s by then, had said, hey, let's put a board to, let's put a group together and we'll fund the bridge. And that's what they did. Um, so the Harrimans funded the bridge. Um, at the time, you know, they were said to have lost money on the bridge. The fact of the matter is the Storm King Highway that we know today didn't exist. That roadway that comes across from um, Woodbury Common that anybody that's been there might have taken to come back this way, that didn't exist. You saw the goat trail, okay? So they really, it got you across the river from Peekskill, but it didn't have the access. So in all fairness to the Hermans, when the Bridge Authority took over in 1940, they also opened, not the Bridge Authority, but the state had opened the Storm King Highway. So it became a much better route for a lot of people to take. Uh, but it was advertised, the Bear Mountain, as a way to get from out west to out east and the other way around, because it was the only way to cut, cross the Hudson south of Albany. So that was a long answer to your, your quick question. Any other questions? Okay, okay how about Thank a round you. of applause for our second speaker? <laughs> so clearly our morning authors know their stuff. Um, please join us out for a book signing now out in the lobby, and then we're going to take a lunch break, and we'll be back for the afternoon sessions beginning at 1 p.m. Thank you.